Hello, in this lecture we'll talk about um, the how Spanish Texas really becomes to take shape during the colonial time period in Texas. But before we get too much into what was happening specifically in the region of Texas, we're going to talk about what was happening in colonial Mexico at the time. Okay, so what they termed as like New Spain. So one of the first things that you have to understand is they had a system called the Enconmienda system. And essentially the system gave usually conquistadors you know, land grants or to, you know, important Spanish people. And they would be given land in Mexico, um, in, in Spanish or, you know, New Spain, I guess. But the deal was they had to Christianize the natives, okay? But in, in because of this, they were out, able to get something called tribute, which tribute is, you know, you have to give certain things. This was a very common thing um, during the, you know, 1500s and 1600s. And so they got some sort of a payment for Christianizing them. But pretty quickly, this became like a form of enslavement. Um, a lot of Native Americans and indigenous peoples, instead of just getting tribute, they were forced into labor, either on farms or in mines. And so there was a friar by the name of Bartholomew de la Casas, and he speaks out. He lived amongst the Native uh, peoples for like four years, realizes that, you know, the mistreatment of them, that they're really good hearted, wonderful people, and appeals to the Pope and he wins, okay? And so the encomienda system is taken away, uh, but pretty quickly that encomienda system is replaced by African la slave labor, which of course has a completely different um, issues, obviously, right? Um, so I wanted to make sure you understood that the encomienda system was in place. The other thing that becomes in place was, um, you know, the Costa system. And so this was a way for uh, the Spanish to allow intermarriage between the native peoples, the indigenous peoples and peninsulares or the people from Spain, okay? And it formed this like new racial identity. So they literally would classify people according to, um, you know, who their parents are, their heritage. And interestingly enough, the Spanish government actually commissioned artists to create paintings. And that's what you're looking at over here on the left. This is a Costa painting. And they would essentially allow them to, um, you know, draw pictures of what a, you know, indigenous woman and a Spanish man might look like with their kid together. So you can kind of see, the woman and the man, and this is what the kid would actually look like, and they would call him another name. So, um, you know, and this is just some of the racial identities that they created. Um, and there's thousands of these Costa paintings, all uh, even in Mexico City today, which is one of the reasons why Mexico City has the largest archives in the world. Um, and you can click that link to see some examples of some Costa paintings. That's kind of fascinating to look at. The other thing to think about too is the fact that the mission system is created. And so, so what the mission system was, is it was a way to like, you know, Christianize the natives. The problem with the area that we call Texas today, right in North New Spain, they called it at that time, was that a lot of the, the indigenous peoples couldn't give the same amount of tribute as the Aztecs and the Incas could because they just didn't have the same kind of resources and gold and wealth. Okay, um, the mission system itself too, what it, what it consisted of was a presidio, which presidio was like uh, where soldiers would be stationed to protect the area. And to a lot of the friars in this mission system, this presidio system was extremely important. Okay, the other part of the mission system was to get rid of these indigenous ways, um, you know, to indoctrinate them. They would form like town councils and things of that nature. But this kind of getting rid of their ways is going to cause a lot of um, the natives, uh, the indigenous peoples to really resist this, okay? Um, the other thing important to think about too is that um, a lot of indigenous groups as scarcity and as resources became even more scarce would actually ask the Spanish later on to create a mission for them, right? Um, because you know, they needed survival. And so some indigenous groups do request that, not all, not, you know, not like a, not, not the ones that were nomadic for sure. So here's kind of a visual 
and you can click on that link there if you want to get a little closer look or pause this video but essentially this is how the Texas missions themselves were set up. Um, some of the issues um, regarding the Texas mission system was that the people in Texas or North New Spain were really difficult to convert. One of the issues was the fact that they were semi-sedentary. What that means is that um, they would only be stationary um, some of the time. But the times when the bison were around, a lot of them would travel. They would leave their, you know, the area and then they would come back. So that made it kind of difficult. Um, the other problem was it wasn't just a religious issue. They would have to give up all kinds of their ways of life in order to become, you know, Spanish and satisfactory to the Spanish. And they really didn't agree with the, the system that the Spanish had in place, particularly as it as it regarded, you know, gender roles and labor. A lot of the indigenous groups disagreed with the fact that everybody had these assigned roles. It was more of a collaborative effort um, with many of the indigenous groups, okay? All right, so uh, I do need to talk about what was happening in New Mexico at the time because New Mexico, um, you know, and its origin had a lot to do with the way especially West Texas was settled. Um, so in about 1595, there was a silver rush that happened um, in the New Mexico region. So. King Philip of Spain at that time ordered what they called pacification, which essentially meant to control the region in these lands. He sends this notorious guy named Juan Uñate, um, who was, you know, pretty horrendous to the Pueblo peoples. Um, there weren't any medals found there, but they did establish some missions there later on. Um, it, it essentially becomes an area of like sheep and sheep farms. Okay, um, so. That's important because in 1680, one of the largest and successful Native American revolts occurs in this region, and this was the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. So in 1659, in the northern region of New Mexico, some missions were established, okay? There was a coordinated effort by a man named Pope, a Pueblo leader, and um, essentially they, he led this group of native um, peoples, this indigenous groups of peoples, um, into this coordinated effort um, to throw out the Spanish and the Spanish rule. And the outcome of it was, was important. They did successfully push the Spanish out. Um, they killed, and there's some numbers up here on the screen, right, 400 settlers, 20 of those missionaries. Um, but, and so it pushes the settlement of, um, of the Spanish down to the southern part of New Mexico, kind of closer to the El Paso region today. Um, and when missions are reestablished years later in the Pueblo region, in the northern New Mexico region, um, the Native Americans were given a lot more autonomy. And that was important to them because they really pushed the Spanish out because they were trying to completely change their ways. And it was a way to really gain back some autonomy. Autonomy means self-power um, in order to get that back. And another thing that's kind of significant about the Pueblo Revolt, and I have this image here to kind of show you, is the fact that um, there's a little bit of irony in this, in, this, um, in this revolt. And the irony behind this is that um, there were hundreds of different languages uh, of the Pueblo's people. Remember, I mentioned before that you know, the names of these indigenous groups, they were not given to them, like they didn't call themselves the Pueblos. This was what the colonizers gave them. They just grouped them together because they had similar traits. So the, the Pueblos really didn't interact except for trade and they didn't organize. Um, but the interesting part is a lot of these indigenous groups did learn Spanish. They learned the language of their colonizers. And so Pope, when he led this revolt, the way that they, he led the revolt and the way he organized them was to speak to everybody in Spanish. So almost irony involved in that they used the colonizers language to launch a successful revolt. Okay, some of the other issues that the Spanish had at the time uh, was the was the French threat, and this is really significant in the settling of San Antonio itself, in the San Antonio or the area um, in East Texas as well. So what happened with this was that in 1666, a French explorer by the name of Lasalle, he begins to settle in like this Canadian region here, and he calls this region Louisiana uh, for the French king. Um, and he eventually, by 1685, he makes it down to Matagorda Bay, 
and creates a settlement over here um, called Fort St. Louis. Um, now, LaSalle is killed by indigenous groups um, in this region, uh, but the Spanish learn about this French encroachment because the, the indigenous peoples are continuing to trade with them and they start bringing items that are French, like a French book and things like that. And they're like, holy cow, oh my gosh, we've got to do something about this, okay? So the um, Spanish, worried about this colonized territory, begin to like re-explore and rediscover Texas again, okay? So in 1690, um, De Leon and Massanet uh, arrive in 1690 in uh, East Texas and they establish San Francisco de Dejas. Now the Caddo uh, indigenous peoples, we talked about that in the last, um, in the last presentation, but you know, they were pretty advanced society. Um, and the fact that uh, De Leon and Massanet showed up without women and children really made them not trust them, okay? So they traded with them and took things from them uh, but the, uh, you know, the mission itself was pretty much a failure and they kind of pull out of Texas because of that. Um, so the French themselves, they try to kind of reestablish these trading networks and they established Nagadoches in 1713. Uh, and because of this like growing threat, um, the Viceroy, they got a new Viceroy of, of Spain he orders the creation of four missions in East Texas. So even though the first one failed, he reorders another four missions in there. This time they bring women and children because they realize their mistake with the Caddo's. Um, and, uh, but ultimately it again was not successful for a couple reasons. Number one, it was really far from the Rio Grande settlement, which was a, a little more of a successful settlement. And, um, and the other thing was that the Caddo's just were really difficult to convert. Um, they were really kind of bucking that. And so instead he orders um, missions to be reestablished or a mission to be reestablished along the San Antonio River. Um, and we know this mission uh, is this mission San Antonio de Valero, which today we know as the Alamo. And that's the first of the five San Antonio missions that were created, okay? So rethinking colonization, um, the French, or I'm sorry, the French, the Spanish um, realized that one of the things that they need to do is bring people to colonize the region in order to make it really successful, okay? In East Texas, um, the, the uh, Viceroy actually sends somebody to go take a look and figure out what the state of those four East Texas missions were. And what they discovered was there were no Indians at the missions. It was overstaffed. It was um, you know, undisciplined. So he orders, the Viceroy orders the closing of all of those East Texas missions and has them move to San Antonio. So that's where the other missions really come from. Um, the other thing that they call for are for colonists. And officially the first colonists in, uh, you know, in uh, San Antonio were the Canary Islanders. And they arrive in, you know, March of 1731. Now these these islanders are called Islinos, um, and they become, they form San Antonio de Bejar, which of course later becomes San Antonio. They expand, they create a very successful missionary, or I'm sorry, irrigation system. But one thing that I do want to point out was that there was some friction between the, you know, soldiers' families that were there because the Islinos saw themselves as kind of superior and kept them out of things. But eventually these two groups do eventually kind of merge together, they intermarry, and they successfully found, you know, San Antonio later on. Um, and so because we're in San Antonio too, I think it's important that we know about the establishment of these missions. And so just like I mentioned, uh, you know, the Alamo was founded in 1718, it's the first one. The next one was Mission San Jose uh, that was established in 1720. And the other three that come are come from the closing of the East Texas missions. And that is Concepcion, which is the best preserved mission. If you haven't been out to the missions, that's a great one to see because it's pretty well preserved. Um, San Juan, Mission San Juan and Espada, the mission of Espada. So those are the five, and you may or may not know this, 
uh, but they are officially considered a World Heritage Site, which is a big designation because of their historical importance. Now we will talk about the establishment of other towns in Texas, but I do want to also mention that Laredo and El Paso were founded about this time. Um, so in 1755, uh, a stockman or ranchman by the name of Tomas Sanchez founded Laredo. This becomes a very successful ranching settlement. Um, you know, by I think five years later, 6,800 peoples are there, uh, mostly settlers, some military, and some uh, what they call neophytes, which are Indian indigenous peoples that live in um, live in the missions or elsewhere that have been converted. Uh, the mission system itself wasn't very successful in Laredo. There was a lot of evidence of mistreatment of the indigenous peoples, and they believe that that um, that is why. Uh, also in the El Paso region. And that's this region over here. And here's um, New, you know, the uh, Laredo area over here. Um, in this region here, uh, by 1765, about 2,800 uh, people that live there. Okay, so I hope that was gives you a picture of how you know um, North New Spain, or as we know, uh, Texas today, uh, was founded and its establishment regarding um, Spanish settlement and uh, Anyway, so I'm also going to put a couple of videos here as well for you to watch that might be of interest to you to give you a little bit more depth of knowledge of it. Have a great day.